Welcome to our Azure Incident Retrospective. I'm David Steele. And I'm Sammy Kubo. We work in the Azure Communications team. In addition to providing a written post-incident review after major outages, we also now host these retrospective conversations. You're about to watch a recording of a live stream where we invited impacted customers through Azure Service Health to join our panel of experts in a live Q&A. We had a conversation about reliability as a shared responsibility. So this includes our learnings at Microsoft, as well as guidance for customers and partners to be more resilient. We hope you enjoy the conversation that follows. And to, to understand the issue a little bit deeper, I'd love to introduce Tom, uh, Tom Jolly, who is the VP of Engineering of um, Azure Storage, and Hala Al Adwan, who is a Partner Director of Engineering of uh, Secrets and Public Key Infrastructure. And Tom, we'll start with you. Storage was the initial trigger for this incident. Could you talk us through a little bit about what happened with storage and how, and how it progressed? Sure. So just to give a little bit of background on, on storage. So what we refer to as a storage scale unit is a set of racks with uh, storage server nodes in. Um, and there are um, a couple of different layers of software running in a scale unit. We have what we call the front end layer, which is where client uh, requests protocols will, will connect to. And then we have obviously the back end roles where we persist data and deal with durability and uh, object semantics and so on. Um, cloud is a multi-tenant service, of course. So one of the things we have to do and, uh, in our front end layer is we keep track on a second by second basis of the requests that are coming in from which clients, which accounts, uh, we decide, you know, it's a scale unit uh, carrying too much load or not. If so, um, are there particular accounts that are uh, uh, putting too much load on the system that we need to then apply throttling to to reduce the load and keep accounts within their limits? So for this incident, um, the cause, we were actually rolling out a change to address a gap in our accounting. So we'd identified a gap where um, it could result in not all transactions being uh, counted by our uh, throttling aggregation mechanism. And that could in turn result in uh, a tenant, a storage scale unit running at higher load than, than we think it is. So we were rolling out a configuration change to address that gap. Uh, and at the point of this incident, that change had already been deployed to, I think about 16, uh, well, th thousands of storage scale units. Uh, and we were probably a week or two weeks into the deployment of that configuration change. So this was quite deep in the, in the storage fleet before we had this problem. Um, we had, the problem we had on, on the, the, the storage scale units that were affected was uh, specific to their configuration. So the result of this change on these clusters was that um, the amount of transactions that were being reported to our throttling mechanism went up. So there was no increase in load because they were already there, but they weren't being counted correctly. So when we deployed this change, the amount of uh, transactions that the throttling mechanism was seeing increased. And on this particular set of storage scale units, the, the maximum allowable transaction limit for those scale units had been configured too low. And when this change deployed, what happened was the, the traffic being accounted now was above the configured maximum for those scale units. and that. Uh, caused the throttling mechanism to start to throttle accounts and throttle transactions and you know essentially fail client requests, including requests from our uh, key vault service. Um, and that's what caused the impact on this set of, of storage scale units. Uh, it took a long time to mitigate. This is definitely way off where we would like to be in terms of uh, being able to mitigate and root cause. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first reason is we had a gap in our monitoring. We, we did not have alerting uh, of a high enough severity kicking in when uh, the throttling started. So the, the availability drop wasn't high enough to trigger any of our availability monitors. And we, we had a gap where some monitors had become disabled that are supposed to alert our um, uh, on-call uh, engineers when a tenant starts to throttle uh, a significant amount of traffic. So that's why the storage team didn't pick this up first. Actually, the, the Key Vault team, AKB team uh, alerting, picked this up first. Uh, once storage was engaged, um, because of the nature of the change, the engineers who were engaged initially thought there was an increase in load and traffic on the storage scale unit because um, the, the amount of traffic being reported had increased, uh, even though um, there was actually no change in load. It's just that the, the accounting had started to count more traffic and it looked like an increase. So it took quite a while for them to figure out uh, that actually there was no change in load, no, cha no uh, change in customer load, and to track it down to, the fact, to, to this uh, uh, accounting change in the throttling aggregation 
and then to track it to the particular configuration change that was being deployed. So that did take uh, a, a few hours, which is is um, you know obviously much slower than we really want to be. Uh, once we identified that, we tested the rollback of the change on some canary uh, scale units. Uh, we manually reverted the change on the clusters uh, scale units that were experiencing the worst throttling. And then we initiated a safe deployment uh, throughout the whole storage fleet to revert that change. Um, the main repairs, I think, for this on the storage side that, that we took away from this one is pretty obvious is the monitoring, right? We, we, shouldn't, we need to make sure monitors like that don't become disabled. Um, that, that added a lot of time. Uh, and then the other thing is that um, going forward, you know, whenever we want to change the way we do our throttling, either the traffic accounting or we want or adjust limits, we really need to do kind of a two-phase rollout where we, you know, roll out the change in a monitor-only mode and we look at the results and then we activate the change. And that's not a mechanism that we we had at that time. And so that's another learning from this is that. Um, there's always going to be a risk of a limit being wrong or uh, something unexpected. So we really want to do that two phase, you know, monitor first uh, and then enforce later. Uh, so that's a mechanism that we're in the process of, of building to try and avoid this kind of pitfall in the future. So, but Tom, what, one question I have is, um, would, would customer resiliency um, levers or, or service using resiliency levers like ZRS or GRS, would, would that have helped in this case? Unfortunately not. Um, in this case, the, the, the scale units that were had the limits too low, unfortunately, were our ZRS clusters, so scale units. So unfortunately, in this case, it wouldn't because it was a it, ZRS is really more designed for zonal, you know, environmental power and some class of software failures. But when you have something like this at, the, at a, sort of the upper layer of the, the logical storage scale unit, unfortunately, it wouldn't have it, it didn't help in this case. These were ZRS uh, scale units. Got it. Um, quick question for you, Tom. I'd love to understand, given that extended duration, you talked a little bit about how this was detected, how this was investigated, how this was mitigated. Are you able to give us an idea, given that timeline of the incident, what, what took the longest time? Like what you've mentioned, there were some difficulties in detecting it. Was it harder to investigate or actually we, we knew what was happening, hard to mitigate? Uh, it, it, we were we were slower than we wanted to be in all of those phases. I mean, I think the first couple hours, I think, were spent with the Key Vault team uh, and then or an hour or two, I'm not sure exactly. And then the storage team was engaged. It took us, I think, three to four hours to to sort of get through that. There's no change in load. It's a change in 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 accounting and then identify the, the offending change. And then the mitigation, I think the time might be a little higher in the incident than it actually was. Um, but obviously, when we're changing it back, we wanted to verify that. So we did that on a canary uh, what I feel, what we public name for that is Canary. Um, the EUAP or the Canary. Yes, yeah. right, EUAP. Um, so we did that there first, and then uh, we applied it manually to the worst affected scale units, and then and then did a broader deployment. So it, it was longer in all phases than we want to be. You, you mentioned that we you 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 put the fix in through safe deployment, and you mentioned this was part of a, a deployment that went out through our safe deployment mm -hmm. practices. Is this something that you could have, should have, would have caught sooner earlier on? Did, was it a lack of testing, or? Um, I, I think the main gap is that we don't have this uh, monitor-only mode for changes to our throttling mechanisms, right? I think that's the biggest gap because we were already thousands of scale units into the into our storage fleet. So. Uh, it wasn't until we arrived at these scale units where the limits had been configured too low that we had that interaction between the accounting change and the misconfigured limit. So, and, and I guess the other piece actually was a scrub of the limits on, on, on the storage scale units that's been done. Um, but no, I, SDP alone wouldn't, didn't help us here. Um, we need that additional uh, uh, two-phase rollout, I think, for this class of change. Yeah, so it sounds like lots of learnings on the, from the storage team. Um, probably a good time for us to bring Harla into this conversation. Now, Harla, you run our secrets or, or public key infrastructure team. Uh, the, the Key Vault was really one of several different Azure services that were impacted by the storage issues that, that Tom talked about. But one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you is Key Vault is so critical for so many other downstream services that, that the fact that Key Vault was impacted by this really hurt several other Azure services. So I, I wanted to start, for people who aren't familiar, could you help us to understand what is Key Vault and, and how do other internal Azure services use it, what for? Sure, so Key Vault is a cloud service. Um, it enables our customers to securely store and manage secrets, um, 
keys and certificates. Um, Key Vault is used internally and externally across Microsoft in really the same capacity. It is um, the primary use cases for Key Vault are to generate and manage keys to encrypt your data or to sign documents. It's to issue and manage or auto manage your certificates for authentication, client authentication or server authentication. And it's to centrally help you control your secrets, such as your API, API keys, your tokens, your passwords or any other secrets that you have in play. Um, so the usage for internally and externally is exactly the same. Um, so uh, Key Vault is, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the question. That's, that's how people use it. Yeah. So then maybe we could understand when it comes to this incident and, and what Tom was describing, how did that impact Key Vault? What, what did the incident cause for you and, and what did Key Vault customers experience during this incident? So um, we got an alert around 608 UTC um, about a quality of service drop in Key Vault, specifically in Western Europe. Um, we actually use Brain for our alerting and um, our on-call engineer was on, the, was on the call pretty quickly and was able to rapidly identify where the dependency failure had happened. And so we, at that point, we immediately engaged the storage team for them to evaluate it. Um, the problem that Tom has just walked us through was impacting the majority of the storage accounts that Key Vault use. And as a result of that, we made the call to fail over to our um, uh, secondary storage, our failover storage, which is North Europe. It's the paired region. Um, the, the thing about failing over for Key Vault is that we fail over into a read-only mode. And that is normally fine because over 99% of our traffic is read-only traffic. Um, but it does impact dramatically our write traffic. And so in that case, we were able to recover our quality of service metrics uh, for reads, but our, our writes were, were impacted pretty dramatically. Um, and so we were in this situation until uh, the storage team was able to revert uh, the change that they made. And once that was done, we were able to fail back to the uh, primary region, and then we were able to recover our uh, read and write throughput. So, so thank you very much, Alan. So my understanding is that, hey, you had an issue, you failed out of the region, and then when the region came healthy, you fell back in again, and then putting less contention or strain for, for read and write operations. Yes. The, uh, one of the pieces I'm interested, does that happen automatically? Um, the minute you see your, your quality of service or your cost numbers drop, do you fail out? Or is that something where you need a human to intervene, but that, of course, that causes time and delays for customers? So yes, on both. Um, it does happen automatically, but in this case, because we weren't sure exactly what the nature of the storage outage was going to look like. We did a manual failover to the backup region. Great. Now, I have seen some customers were asking us about fault isolation to ensure that this issue kind of doesn't impact Key Vault in a whole region. Uh, how does that align? Did you experience a kind of region-wide issue here, or, or is there kind of better investments in fault isolation that might have helped to reduce the blast radius? Um, we did experience a region impact, and um, I'll talk a little bit about the nature of how Azure Key Vault failback, failover was um, designed. So originally, when the failover for Key Vault was designed, there were two main factors that went into deciding how we implemented the failover. The primary factor was that at that time, the majority of the workloads that were utilizing Key Vault were generally um, had scenarios of using fairly static certificates, secrets, and keys. Um, the second factor is that over 99% of our traffic is read-only traffic. And so the solution that we went forward with for failover um, utilizes the storage uh, read-only replicas into the paired region. And so the decision was made that we were going to provide this failover solution from a read-only perspective. Now, since that decision has been made, our workload traffic has changed significantly. And we have a lot more dynamic, we have a lot more workloads that use dynamically generated secrets. And so the impact on uh, these workloads is pretty dramatic when we are in, in a situation where rights are not accessible at all. And so we have a couple of work items um, in the short term that we are doing to mitigate this. And one of them is, we are actively changing our retry and our circuit breaker logic uh, specifically to help us um, reduce any impact we have on writes as much as possible. The team's actively working on that right now. We're also looking at scenarios where, like in this case, not all of our storage accounts were impacted. Some of them were impacted. Um, the majority of them were impacted, but um, not all of them. And so are there situations where we can fail over certain storage accounts um, and maintain the ones that aren't impacted so that we're not taking a full region-wide um, write walk. 
uh, in the long term, we are actively researching different options to give us the optimal um, solution so we can have full read write failover. Super. G given that Key Vault is such a critical service and, and so many customers and internal services depend on it as well, is there any, are there any resiliency or any additional steps that customers can do to be immune to this type of thing? If it happens again, is there any additional thing that customers can do so they're not impacted? So I, I guess I, what I would say is the same thing that we are looking at doing internally. I would suggest that customers explore doing externally, which is to really be regionally redundant, um, deploy your services in multiple regions, deploy your dependencies in multiple regions. And that way, if one region is impacted, you're able to fail over to a secondary region. Internally, what we're also doing is we're working very closely with our internal customers to identify specific patterns to help them be more resilient for uh, different types of key vault outages. Great. That's, that's great guidance that we hear pretty regularly. Don't, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't put all your eggs in one region. Um, Sammy, just, just as I have, I, I'd love to turn the table and, and ask you, since you run our comms team, uh, this was a complicated outage. This has multiple services. How did we do from a communications perspective? Uh, as Hala mentioned, we. Brain did communicate, uh, and Brain did very well in communicating to some services re very quickly. Um, Brain didn't do a great job of correlating. And so what happened, as you, you mentioned, our, our beloved tracking ID, tracking ID that we use, there are four tracking IDs that went out for this incident. And so many customers would have seen different tracking IDs for the same issue. So on one hand, Brain was communicating to some impacted services and some impacted scenarios. Uh, there were manual comms to, to augment this as well, but it would have been messy for customers who were impacted by more than just Key Vault. And they would have seen storage over here and Key Vault over here and another service over here. Um, while, uh, as Tom mentioned, it wasn't all of the storage accounts that were impacted, um, it was some of them, the same way that we did see broad impact in terms of services, so the number of services is high, but the number of customers on some of the services were very, very small and very, very slight. Unfortunately, most of the Key Vault uh, customers were using those impacted uh, storage uh, uh, accounts, so, but there are many, many services where they would have had a handful of customers using those accounts, and so impact was light for some, very heavy for others. But as I said, the, the correlation of the issue was was a challenge for us, and then we were doing making the right investments in brain so that not only we can commun communicate quickly, but we can start seeing patterns and say, this is a West Europe issue, and we can start saying, yep, it's dependent on this storage uh, failure. Right, so we're glad brain was communicating because it got something out quickly, but we might have confused customers with multiple tracking IDs when they were actually related. That's that helpful on. to understand. Thank you for watching this Azure incident retrospective. At the scale of which our cloud operates at, incidents are inevitable. Just as Microsoft is always learning and improving, we hope our customers and partners can learn from these too and provide a lot of reliability guidance through the Azure Well-Architected Framework. To ensure that you get posted into reviews after an outage and invites to join these live stream Q&A sessions, please ensure that you have Azure Service Health Alerts set up. We really focused on being as transparent as possible and showing up and being accountable after these major incidents. Whether it's an outage, a security, or a privacy event, Microsoft is investing heavily in these events to ensure that we earn, maintain, and at times, rebuild your trust. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.